a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ is mediator of a new covenant, since a death has taken place for deliverance from transgressions under the first covenant. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf, not that he might offer himself repeatedly, as a high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, offered once to take away sins of many, will appear a second time not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous deeds. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand has won victory for him. His holy arm. Thanks be to the Lord for his song, for he has done marvelous deeds. The Lord has made his salvation known. In the sight of the nations, he has revealed his justice. He has remembered his kindness and his faithfulness towards the house of Israel. Thanks be to the Lord for his song, for he has done marvelous deeds. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation by our God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Break into song, sing praise. Sing, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous Sing praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Sing joyfully before the King, the Lord. Sancti Evangelii secundum Marcu. Gloria The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said of Jesus, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen, I say to you, all sins and, blas and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. 
for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Pebum Domini. St. Thomas Aquinas is, of course, very well known for his extensive philosophical and theological writings. I mean, he wrote enough to fill 20 large volumes of work, of intellectual work, including his masterpieces, the Summa Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologica. His writings have been a fundamental part of seminary instruction until perhaps the last 50 or so years. Now, there are still at least some seminaries who use his writings, especially like my seminary, who utilize his writings on both philosophy and also theology. And they provide a very clear, a very approachable and understandable exposition of various aspects of the Catholic faith and of theology. He indeed had a very a brilliant intellect and an acute understanding of both natural and also supernatural things. And yet persons, of course, as we know, are not canonized saints simply on the basis of their great volumes of writing, of their intellectual work or for their intellectual genius. And there have been a number of incredibly brilliant Catholics throughout history, you know, who have written amazing works, but they have not been canonized saints. So what is perhaps not emphasized quite as much with Aquinas is really the extent of his sanctity, his holiness, and his virtue. In fact, the clarity and the effectiveness of his writings can largely be attributed to his fervent prayer and his devotion to our Lord, to his real presence in the Most Holy Eucharist. And one of his fellow Dominicans, Brother Reginald, remarked that Thomas's incredible knowledge was far less due to his genius than to the efficacy of his prayers. As seminarians, we would often hear the expression that, set, that the study of theology must be done on our knees. And St. Thomas is a prime example of theology flowing from the time that he spent in devout prayer as he sought a greater understanding of the mysteries of the faith straight from the source himself from God. Now, despite having such a superior intellect, Aquinas was a, a very humble man. And as he began his studies <clears throat> as a Dominican under the, another doctor of the church, St. Albert the Great, Aquinas was often very quiet, you know, during the classroom discussions and during the debates. And his silence, combined with his large, bulky figure, earned him the nickname the Sicilian, the dumb Sicilian ox, or the dumb ox for short. And they mistakenly thought that Aquinas was intellectually dull and was you know, struggling to understand the material. But yet he never boasted of his intellectual abilities. And one of Thomas's companions even took pity on him and you know, offered to tutor him. And in response, you know, Thomas actually humbly and gratefully accepted this. But yet when they came across some difficult passage that stumped the tutor, Aquinas was able to explain it so clearly and so correctly that he amazed his tutor. And so as it became more and more apparent how Aquinas was actually very bright, contrary to you know, the common perception among the students, his teacher, Albert the Great, remarked, we call Brother Thomas the dumb ox, but I tell you that he will yet make his lowing heard to the uttermost parts of the earth, and how true he was. And at one point in his life, Thomas was asked whether he was ever tempted to pride or vainglory, and he responded no, and added that if any prideful thoughts occurred to him, his common sense would expose them as unreasonable and he would dismiss them just as quickly. He never allowed those thoughts to stay if they did come to his mind. 
He always showed deference to others and regarded others as better than himself, not out of a sense of unhealthy self-loathing, but rather out of his profound humility, which flowed from his life of deep prayer. And finally, he had such a depth of piety and love for the Holy Eucharist, which finds its expression in the beautiful hymns that he wrote. And when Pope Urban IV, at the prompting of St. Juliana of Liege, decided to institute the Universal Feast of Corpus Christi, which we celebrate you know, immediately, pretty much immediately after the Easter season, which is a solemnity in honor of the Holy Eucharist, he asked St. Thomas to compose the divine office, which is what priests and religious pray, and the mass for that day. And if you go to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, Alabama, to the Eucharistic Center there, you'll see actually a statue of St. Thomas Aquinas inside the Eucharistic Center. He's sitting at his desk and he's writing, writing out these hymns for Corpus Christi. And then you'll see also a stained glass window of St. Juliana of Liege. So I invite, of course, anyone who would like to come who hasn't come yet to see the Eucharistic Center. This is something that you will see inside it as well. And the hymns that he composed for Corpus Christi are still very commonly in use today. You know, some of them are, we're very familiar with. The last two verses of each of the hymns, Verbum Supernum and Pange Lingua, respectively, are used during exposition and benediction services. You know, we have the O Salutaris Hostia and the Tantum Mergo. And he also composed the sequence for Corpus Christi, for the Mass of Corpus Christi, called Laudation. And then the very well-known hymn, also Pange, Panis Angelicus, you know, the Bread of Angels. Now, one of my personal favorites is the, the hymn Adoro Te Devote, which was famously translated by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And the second verse speaks to the fact that our faith in the Eucharist is strictly based not on our senses alone, but on the truth of the word of Jesus Christ. And so we will end on these words, the this, this second verse, which reflects the pure and simple faith of St. Thomas, the angelic doctor, in the word of his Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing, touching, tasting, are in thee deceived. How says trusty hearing, that shall be believed. What God's Son has told me, take for truth I do. Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true.